we're going to start with a new exciting block and we're going to talk about unsupervised learning. In particular we're going to talk about clustering, what different types of clustering do we have and how can we measure different quality of the clustering. So going back to the first video in the series, remember that we have two questions to rule them all. And the two questions were, is my data numerical or categorical? And the second mo mo more important one is, what type of problem do I want to solve? So, so far we've discussed supervised learning in which we have labeled data, and we have a clear cut difference between input and output, or we, we had the relationship between variables, and we wanted to extract some sort of relation or to do forecasting into the future. But now the question is going to be different. The question is about, finding patterns or let the data speak or can we create groups automatically? Okay, so we are going to cover this part of the table in, in which, unlike in super, supervised learning in which we already knew the classes, we want to create those classes automatically. Okay, let me take you an example. So this year, the 2020, the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to the World Food Program, that, that's good news. And imagine that you want to solve this sort of problem. So this is the map of Madrid and you have some points scattered, which are points in which you can, I don't know, some users can go to the food banks and, and, and you are trying to manage this, the logistics of this problem. So you want to distribute food in different banks and you want to know what is the best strategy to, to solve these questions. Like for instance, can we group them together so we can reduce logistic costs or even how can we assign users to different food banks? So this is a classical problem of clustering and our human brain is really good creating clusters. So if you take this data, you could say, okay, you can group them together according to these ellipsoids. For a computer, this is actually a much harder problem to solve. So let me emphasize this idea that we are not doing classification anymore. So we are doing clustering. The difference is that in this, in this case, for instance, we knew already the classes. So we wanted to draw this line separating one group from the other. And now we are trying to find different groups automatically. So imagine that you have all the data, uh, let's say from the mortgage information in the data set, and you want to classify customers according to that data, but without knowing in advance what kind of customer are we dealing with. And actually, the, the problem is that we don't even know how many classes do we have. And this is interesting on the one hand, but also it's going to be uncertain and some sort of unexplored territory. So to understand what is clustering, we have to understand how can we define a cluster, how can we define a group. And we have a couple of criteria. The first one is internal homogeneity. So objects in the same cluster should be similar to each other. And the other is called external separation. So objects in different clusters should be dissimilar from each other. Okay. So take a look at this point. So we see different points and we want to cluster them. So I would say that internal homogeneity would tell me that, okay, this is clearly a cluster. And also we have some sort of pattern here, here that is, at least to my brain is kind of clear. And external separation is this, are these gaps between the data sets. But, but in the end, this is a subjective task. So we could say that we have four groups or maybe we have nine. So maybe this is one group and this is another. And here we have another two, another three and another two. Okay, so how can we solve this thing? And, and, and here you have another problem. So imagine that you have these data points scattered around. If you think about in, in terms of points, you could say, okay, this is a good clustering. So maybe this should be another cluster. But the problem is that what if this is just uh, the, the extraction of an image? So this could be some glasses and this could be, I don't know, the face of Mickey Mouse or this could be a rubber or, and, and I don't know. So in that case, our brain clearly would classify this differently. So as you can see, the data is blind to our criteria. And the problem is that whenever we define a criterion, we're going to have a different number of groups. So going back to our previous example, so we decided that this was a good partition, but what about this one? Or even what about this one? So depending on the subjective decision, of what is homogeneity, for instance, or how can we define a gap, we're going to reach different conclusions. So we have different approaches to doing clustering. So the, the most popular one is called partitional clustering, in which we try to divide data points into some pre-specified number of clusters. For instance, you could say, I want five clusters or three or seven or whatever. And the task is, is how to create those clusters in the most efficient way. The second type of clustering is called hierarchical clustering. This is, can, this is uh, largely different from, from partitional clustering in the sense that we can start with all individuals in one group and then we divide that group into subgroups or the other way around. So we can start with ind independent observations and then we try to group them together according to some criterion. We also have model-based clustering in which the idea basically is try to find the probability of all the data points belonging to the same cluster or to a different clustering. Uh, typically, we use Gaussian distributions, and the good thing with model-based clustering is that we have not, not only 
we are not only saying that this data point is in this cluster, but we are saying that this data point is in this cluster with this probability and this other cluster with some other probability. And there are, of course, hybrid methods that try to combine those previous ones. Okay, the most popular one in the partitional clustering camp is called k-means. So if you know how to do k-means, you know more than 90% of data scientists out there. And hierarchical trees is the, the most traditional one for hierarchical clustering. And Gaussian mixture models, or GM, GMM, is the most popular into this model-based clustering field. And this is uh, more advanced than the, than, the, than the other two. So being practical, how are we going to do that? Well, as usual, we're going to collect data, we're going to pre-process, and we're going to clean and do some feature selections uh, in the same fashion as before. And the, the novelty here is that when we choose the model, we have to decide not only the model, but also the proximity measure that I'm going to talk about later. And we also want to fit the patterns. We also want to fit the parameters, and, and we are going to call that cluster validation. And of course, the idea of how can we generalize these results, or how can we make some interpretation of the data. I love this book by Trevor Hasty and collaborators, and actually you can download it for free, so you can go to this direction, or directly you can type the title of the book. And I love this section in the book in, in which the authors talk about small decisions with big consequences. So the first consequence is related to the data. So we should standardize the data somehow because otherwise we're going to compare things that are not comparable. So we've deal with this sort of problem before, but you cannot compare money, for instance, with height or weight or other parameter, which is in a different unit. The other type of problem, which is very common in clustering, is in, in the case of hierarchical clustering, in which way we define the similarity. Or how can we connect different observations? Or how can we cut the dendrogram? And I will explain that later. In order to obtain clusters and, and be sure that those clusters make sense. And in the case of k-means and other partition or clustering methods, how many clusters should we look for the data? So as, as we showed in the previous example, three look right, but also five or, or even four. Okay. So these decisions are going to change a lot the outcome. So imagine that you have this data. Depending on the method and depending on, for instance, the similarity measures or distance measures, we could have something like that, in which we have this clear-cut separation between the blues and, and the blacks, but this doesn't look ri right in our brain. So the, into our brain, probably this is one cluster and this is the other. So as you can see, we have a lot of decisions to make and we're going to explore them in the, in the next videos.